Consider the following things: 1. How much God hath bestowed upon you, in the endowments of your nature. God hath made you rational, intelligent creatures, hath endowed you with noble powers, those endowments wherein the natural image of God consists. You are vastly exalted in your nature above the other kinds of creatures here below. You are capable of a thousand times as much as any of the brute creatures. He hath given you a power of understanding, which is capable of vastly extending itself, of looking back to the beginning of time, and of considering what was before the world was, and of looking forward beyond the end of time. It is capable of extending beyond the utmost limits of the universe, and is a faculty whereby you are akin to angels, and are capable even of knowing God, of contemplating the divine being and his glorious perfections, manifested in his works and in his word. You have souls capable of being the habitation of the Holy Spirit of God and his divine grace. You are capable of the noble employments of angels. How lamentable and shameful it is that such a creature should be altogether useless and live in vain. How lamentable that such a noble and excellent piece of divine workmanship should fail off its end and be to no purpose. Was it ever worth while for God to make you such a creature with such a noble nature and so much above other kinds of creatures only to eat and drink and gratify your sensual appetites? How lamentable and shameful to you that such a noble tree should be more useless than any tree of the forest, that man whom God hath thus set in honour should make himself more worthless than the beasts that perish. 2. How much God hath done for you in the creation of the world. He made the earth and seas and all the fullness of them for the use of man, and hath given them to him. Psalm 115.16 the earth hath he given to the children of men. He made the vast variety of creatures for man's use and service. Genesis 1.28 Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. For the same purpose he made all the plants and herbs and trees of the field. Genesis 1.29 I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree, yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. He made the sun in the heavens, the glorious luminary, the wonderful globe of light, to give light to man, and to constitute the difference between day and night. He also made the moon, and the vast multitude of stars, for the use of man, to be to him for signs and seasons. What great provision hath God made for man? What a vast variety of good things for food and otherwise to be for his convenience, to put him under advantages to be useful. How lamentable is it that after all these things he should be a useless creature in the world? 3. How much is done for you in the course of God's common providence? Consider how nature is continually labouring for you. The sun is, as it were, in a ferment for mankind, unweariedly running his course from year to year and from day to day and spending his rays upon man, to put him under advantage to be useful, every day giving him light that he may have opportunity to behold the glorious wisdom of God and to see and serve God. The winds and clouds are continually labouring for you and the waters are going in a constant circulation ascending in the air from the seas, descending in rain, gathering in streams and rivers, returning to the sea, and again ascending and descending for you. The earth is continually labouring to bring forth her fruit for your support. The trees of the field are labouring and spending their strength for you. And how many of the poor brute creatures are continually labouring for you, and spending their strength for you? How much of the earth is spent upon you? How many of God's creatures are devoured by you? How many of the lives of the living creatures of God are destroyed for your sake, for your support and comfort? Now, how lamentable will it be if after all you be altogether useless and live to no purpose? What mere cumberers of the ground will you be? Agreeably to Luke 13, 7 Nature, which thus continually labours for you, will be burdened with you. This seems to be what the Apostle means. 
Romans 8, 20, 21 and 22, where he tells us that the creation is made subject to vanity and brought into the bondage of corruption, and that the whole creation groans and travails in pain under his bondage. 4. How much is done for you in the use of the means of grace? How much hath God done to provide you with suitable means and advantages for usefulness? How many prophets hath God sent into the world in different ages, inspiring them with his Holy Spirit, and enabling them to work many miracles to confirm their word, whereby you now have the written word of God to instruct you? How great a thing hath God done for you to give you opportunity and advantage to be useful, in that he has sent his own Son into the world? He who is really and truly God, united himself to the human nature, and became a man, to be a prophet and teacher to you and other sinners. Yea, he lay down his life to make atonement for sin, that you might have encouragement to serve God with hopes of acceptance. How many ordinances have been instituted for you? How much of the labour of the ministers of God hath been spent upon you? Is not that true concerning you which is written in Isaiah 5 at the beginning? Concerning the vineyard planted in a very fruitful hill, and fenced and cultivated with peculiar care and pains, which yet proved unfruitful, how much hath the dresser of the vineyard digged about the barren tree, and dunged it, and yet it remains barren? Consider what a shame it is that you should live in vain, when all the other creatures that are inferior to you do glorify their Creator according to their nature. You who are so highly exalted in the world, are more useless than the brute creation, yea, than the meanest worms, or things without life, as earth and stones. For they all do answer their end, in the way in which nature hath fitted them for it. None of them fail it. They are all useful in their places, all render the proper tribute of praise to their Creator, while you are mere nuisances in the creation, and burdens to the earth, as any tree of the forest is more useful than the vine, if it bear not fruit. 4. Let me, in a further application of this doctrine, exhort you by all means to bring forth fruit to God. Let it be your constant endeavour to be in this way actively useful in the world. Here, consider three things. 1. What an honour it will be to such poor creatures as you are to bring forth fruit to the divine glory. What is such a poor worm as man, that he should be enabled to bring forth any fruit to God? It is the greatest honour of the nature of man, that God hath given him a capacity of glorifying the great Creator. It is what no other creature in this lower world can do, in the same manner as man. There is no creature in the visible world that is capable of actively glorifying God, but man. 2. In bringing forth fruit to God, you will be so profitable to none as to yourselves. You cannot thereby be profitable to God.